Welcome to Lesson 6, The Lord's Supper. I want to encourage you to get your Bible out, print out a copy of the syllabus from the website, and follow along as we teach the course. My opening statement concerning the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, commonly known as communion, is a sacrament and an ordinance instituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Noah Webster defines an ordinance as an authoritative decree or direction, an order, a law set forth by a government or authority, specifically a municipal regulation, something ordained or decreed by a fate or deity, a prescribed usage, practice, or ceremony. Now, it is also a sacrament and is defined as a formal religious act that is sacred as a sign or symbol of a spiritual reality, especially one believed to have been instituted or recognized by Jesus Christ. Now, two key points. Number one, the Lord's Supper is a reminder to the church as well as to the world that Jesus Christ was sent to have his body bruised and to shed his precious blood for a lost, sinful, rebellious, hell-deserving, deprived mankind and to elevate mankind to the highest possible position and place imaginable the position of a son or a daughter of God. Now, let's stop there for a second because the first Sunday of every month, Kingdom Living Church, it is our custom to receive Holy Communion. This is so important. Now, why do we do it? Well, we're going to learn more, but it is a sacrament. It is, uh, it is something that God has ordained for the church to participate in to remember and to reflect what Jesus has done for us. We are to do this until we are taken away in the rapture. So this is, this is a powerful teaching. It is a sacrament. sacrament. It is an ordinance that the church is to participate in. I've given you the definitions, so let's go a little further. Now, the following is a synoptic gospel account of the Last Supper. Now, by synoptic, it means presenting or taking the same or common view specifically related to the first three Gospels of the New Testament. So, ladies and gentlemen, when the word, the term Gospels, what does that mean? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. Those are the Gospels. It focuses on the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, we're looking at a synoptic perspective of the same event from three different perspectives. Now, this is important because if you look at it this way, let's say, for instance, for instance, you saw a crime happen. Someone else saw the same crime, and a third person saw the same crime take place. And the police come to say, can you tell me what happened? Now, all three individuals saw the same thing happen. But when you look at the evidence and it's, and it's told to the police officer, you'll get three uniquely different perspectives of the same event. That's what we mean by synoptic. It takes one event and gives you three different perspectives in this case. Because everyone's personality is different. And how we see things, though we're seeing the same thing, we can see it from a different perspective. So it is by seeing it from all three perspectives that you get a clear understanding of what truly happened. And that's why this practice is so important. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. Matthew, first book of the New Testament. Chapter 26, verse 26. Reads as follows. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Verse 27, And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Glory to God. Verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day which I drink 
it knew with you in my father's kingdom. So what you're seeing is that the, the bread represents the body of Christ. The cup, the juice that we drink, represents the blood of Christ, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. The bread represents his body. Now, what did Jesus do in his body? He took stripes. I think it's been proven, 39 stripes in his body. And if I understand correctly, there are 39 different classifications of sickness and disease in the earth. 39. So Jesus took a stripe in his body. He was lashed in his body to represent a sickness or disease that the human family had been afflicted with by Satan. And the juice represents his blood, which took away the sins of the whole world. Boy, that's such a powerful statement. Jesus' blood. See, this is the reason why it was so easy for you and I to become born again. All we've got to do is confess our sins and ask him to come into our heart and make a confession with our mouths. And in that instant, we become born again. That's only possible because of what Jesus did. His blood was so powerful, it wiped the entire universe down to the subatomic level of every trace of sin. So now all a person has to do is to ask Jesus to come into his heart. And you become born again. Let's keep moving. Let's look now at Mark's account. Let's go to Mark chapter 14. verse. So we saw Matthew's account of what happened at what's called the Last Supper. Let's look at Mark's account. Matthew, Mark, chapter 14 and 22. Reads as follows. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of this fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it, in, it drink it new in the kingdom of God. So you see, you see now Mark's perspective on what he saw at the Last Supper. So there's Matthew, there's Mark. Now let's look at Luke. Luke 22 and 19. Luke 22 and 19. And it reads as follows. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Isn't that wonderful? Which is shed for you. So we've seen Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of what happened at the Lord's Supper. Now, let's look at item number three, the revelation and understanding of the Lord's Supper given to Paul. Let's now go to 1 Corinthians 10.16. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, it is, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Let's look now at verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. So this is so important. So we must understand this, the revelation of what the sacrament of Holy Communion means to you and I as a believer. Let's go back. I want to read verse 16 again. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? 
the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So literally we are communing. This is the understanding we must have. When you partake of Holy Communion, you are communing. You are connected. You are demonstrating both the blood and the body of Christ. This is why it's so important and why Jesus commanded us, the church, to be partakers of this sacrament, this ordinance of Holy Communion. Now, we are to take communion reverently. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, 27. 1 Corinthians 11, 27. It reads as follows. Wherefore, whosoever eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, what does that mean to us? It means we must partake of Holy Communion reverently. See, as a born-again believer, you have the power and the freedom from sin. You have the power over sin. So we are to be reverent. That means respectful to God when we partake of Holy Communion because we understand what Jesus did for us in allowing his body to be bruised, not for his sin, but for ours. Allowing his blood to be shed, not for his transgressions, but for ours. Remember now, Jesus never committed a single sin. He was sinless. That's why the shedding of his blood fulfilled the requirement that the Father had designated to be able to redeem the human family back to God. If Jesus would have sinned in any way, shape, or form, he would not have been qualified to die on the cross for us. But because he knew no sin, he was the perfect presentation of God and man and earth. He uniquely qualified to pay the price for us. And this is why we partake of Holy Communion. It's holy. It must be done reverently. And people who do it unreverently they suffer the consequences. There are consequences to not have the proper reverence for communion. Let's read that verse again. Um, let's keep reading. Verse 27. Okay. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In other words, the consequence of doing this unworthily. Now this is the believer now, because unbelievers cannot receive Holy Communion. The Bible says many of them die prematurely. They're sickly in their lives. Why? Because they are partaking of the Lord's body and his blood unworthily, without the proper reverence that it requires, that it is worthy of. Amen. But that will not be, that will not be your testimony. Now, item five, we must judge ourselves to ensure we are not judged. 31 and 32 of the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So it's important that you self-assess. Am I, am I taking Holy Communion reverently? Stop for a minute and think about it. If you've done anything, if you sinned, Repent of your sins before you receive Holy Communion. You just repent and do it honestly. Be honest with God and ask God to forgive you. And he's faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. Now, Kingdom Living Church takes Holy Communion the first Sunday of each month, which I alluded to. What should be our attitude when partaking of Holy Communion? So you need to write that down. Think about what you've heard in this teaching and answer that question accordingly. God bless you.